Water has many purposes, from quenching thirst to use in the chemistry lab. However, even though hurricanes, floods, tsunamis, and thunderstorms wreck the earth, there is a problem that surpasses even such inexorable catastrophic events in terms of disaster. This problem is of growing water scarcity. Water is the source of life on planet Earth. Every living being on Earth, humans, animals, trees, etc., needs fresh water to survive. If not for fresh water, every living thing on Earth would perish. But what exactly is water scarcity? Water scarcity is the lack of clean and usable fresh water. But why is there not enough water, given that over 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water? And what happens when all the fresh water runs out? My name is Sue Mackey, and I am Manager of Customer Relations and Education for the City of Carmel Utilities Department. Thank you. Would you please explain to me what steps are involved in the process of water resource management? Water resource management is like a big term used to manage our water resources and what water we have um, on our earth and in our country and state and city and to make sure that you get the best use out of that water and use it in the most efficient manner possible. So it encompasses things from all the way to um, protecting our water sources, which is both our aquifers underground and our lakes, rivers, and streams, to a how it goes at the end through our system of water a process through the water towers, water plants, and then into your homes, and then how it is treated at the end of, at the wastewater treatment plant. So it comes all the way full cycle, and it's managing that whole process. Water scarcity started impacting the world in 1999 when 31 countries with a total of 500 million people face either water stress or water scarcity. Water stress is the stage before water scarcity or potential water scarcity. Some of it happens because there is not enough water in certain places. In the Sahara Desert, the average rainfall per year is only 2.5 centimeters. Although overall the U.S. has low water stress, the country right under us does. Mexico has considerably higher water scarcity, which is mirrored in several parts of the world like South America, Africa, Asia, and Australia. Yet, people appear to be taking the imminent threat of water scarcity rather lightly. Water scarcity is a real threat. If we don't stop it, the world could have too little usable fresh water. So what can we do to stop or control the further deterioration of water scarcity problems? The answer lies in a variety of solutions, the most important of which includes lesser water usage in a way that water wastage is prevented. Every drop saved is every drop that we don't have to worry about. If all of us practice better behavior and simple everyday tasks, such as turning off faucets while brushing, using water from buckets instead of the shower for baths, occasional hand cleaning of dishes and laundry, not running the water sprinklers every day, we would be conserving significant amounts of water. The general public needs to be better educated on usage of water. The drinking water, or potable water, whether people use it for drinking or whether they use perfect water that could be used for drinking for other sources, such as watering their lawns or flowers, the amount of water used per day in the United States averages about 150 gallons per day per person. That's a lot of water. Now that varies from different parts of the country. In the southwest, where they're currently undergoing a drought and that there's less plentiful water sources naturally, they use less water per person because they, they don't just don't have the water to, to use. So there you see water uses under probably getting close to 80 gallons per day per person. Some parts of the world, like Australia, is known for their very good water use efficiency. They use about 50 gallons a day per, per, or less per person. So you see this whole spectrum in um, the water use. Here in Carmel, we are on the high side. That is a couple reasons. One, we have lots of water available to us. 
And the other reason is that it's very inexpensive, it's cheap. So there's not that financial penalty to using lots of water. It's cheap and we just use it in water and we leave our faucets running and we just um, use it freely because of the plentiful water source. The next big issue is surrounding water pollution. Factory waste and other human generated waste get dumped into water bodies every day often in enormous quantities, which is equivalent to dumping toxins in water, thereby rendering it unfit for consumption. The severity of water pollution, however, depends on quantities, how much of a polluting substance is released into how big a volume of water. A small quantity of toxic chemical may have little impact if it is spilled into the ocean from a ship, but the same amount of chemical can have a much bigger impact pumped into a lake or river where there is less clean water to disperse it. The infamous BP oil rig explosion has spewed 170 million gallons of toxic crude oil into the Gulf of Mexico, killed 11 workers, and wreaked havoc on habitat and wildlife, employment and pay, basic health and family welfare, which is in short devastation to the entire region. Water distribution is the next most important step in the water delivery chain. Water distribution refers to the method by which water from the source, such as streams, waterfalls, reservoirs, etc., are transported to where the human beings need to use them. Unless there is a good distribution network that successfully transports clean drinking water to supply the public's demand, the water problem would continue to plague us even if we had an endless supply, which unfortunately we do not. This is mostly a predicament in underdeveloped or developing countries. In developed countries like USA, there is usually an advanced water distribution system which has the ability to transport water both safely and efficiently. However, sometimes the water distribution systems in rural areas are not as advanced as those in urban areas, even in developed countries. Villagers in underdeveloped countries often rely on wells for water or without a proper purification system. Unfortunately, without a proper wellhead protection system, well water can become contaminated because of irresponsible human behavior. In order to prevent groundwater contamination, advanced countries operate household hazardous waste collection programs.
these filters here are set up for every time 4 million gallons is ran through them, then we then physically backwash them. This is one of the uh, things that is not computer ran. We do physically backwash these ourselves. So that once we're pumping a lot more water in the summertime, these obviously have to be backwashed more frequently because of the run time and the pull on the wells is going to bring more iron, more manganese in here where they could um, build up quicker and we need to wash them more frequently. So that's, uh, summertime is definitely our, uh, our busy time around here when uh, the pools, the irrigation, uh, watering flowers is all going, that's, uh, that's when we are at our prime. into the drinking water. Um, when we were in the softer room, you looked at the two pipes coming in there, one being chlorine and one being fluoride, and this is when we inject it just prior to storage. So, um, this is um, controlled by operators and also based off flow. Um, the only thing that is controlled by operators here is that we physically um, put the 50 pound bags of sodium fluoride into this tank and then it moves over to our saturation tank and from there the, the pumps draw it out based off of flow as well. That's our finished water at that point. And that says finished water on it, correct? And it goes down, it goes down. room at the wastewater treatment plant. Just like you pasteurize milk, we pasteurize our biosol. This is a methane waste gas burner. We use some of it to heat the digesters, which are the tanks, the big round tanks. They each hold a million six hundred thousand gallons apiece. And the reason why we heat it is to kill off the pathogenic bacteria. That is the boiler. That's what heats the biopasteurization process and also heats the digesters. And it runs off of methane gas that we recycle, or it could also run off of natural gas if need be. But primarily, we always run it off of methane gas. These are aeration tanks. The effluent or flow leaving the primary tanks comes to the micro. It comes to the aeration tanks. We have ten of them, and we know, and we run what is called extended aeration, which means it's got to go through one tank all the way through another tank. And, all, and then exit the third tank before it's discharged. Here, the food from the primary tanks are introduced to the microorganisms. And the detention time for this particular process is somewhere between six to eight hours before it leaves. Okay, so all that water, all the wastewater that, that comes in here, starting from the bu big building, the head works, and then it goes to the primary tanks. The primary tanks. And then it goes to the final clarifiers. And then it goes to the final clarifiers. And then finally it gets discharged. dumped. Discharged. It gets ditch discharged discharge. in the White River, which we see here. Constant availability of clean fresh water to its citizens should be a priority for every country. This goal can be accomplished in many ways. The first would be availability of plentiful sources, which although a great goal is not always possible because the sources of water are limited, while population around the world just keeps increasing. Second would be judicious usage of water, where every human being uses just as much water as he or she needs and does not waste any. Last but not the least, by treating wastewater, we increase the chances of more people having access to clean water.